You're listening to the One Step Deeper Podcast with your host, Jimmy Moore and Brittany Davis. One Step Deeper Podcast.com. It's pouring down rain here. It's such a weird time of year because we're coming out of the winter. We're already, already past daylight savings time, which I heard they're trying to like make that permanent now where we always stay in daylight savings time. Not sure what I think about that as an early to bed, early to rise guy. Yeah. It's still, it's still sunny when I go to bed still. <laughs> so. Yeah, I understand, like, from your point of view, but, like, it has been really nice to have Wild Man home and it not be dark. You know, that's good yeah. for him these days that he's getting home and it's like, ah, oh, 10 minutes of daylight. Yeah, <laughs> like a little stroll down the neighborhood just for a moment. Yes, that's cool. That's true. So, no, I'm going to be greedy and make it all about me. I, you can't save your Brittany. It's not going to happen. I have the knowledge, but I don't. that doesn't mean I want to change. <laughs> A good segue there. Yes, yes. Here in uh, episode 61, that's what we're talking about. Behavioral change is so much more than just knowledge. Um, and we're going to get into all the things that it is. It is knowledge, but it's not just knowledge. So we're going to have a lot to say on this topic here today. One step deeper podcast.com is the website. Go check us out over there. You can see all the past episodes, listen to them, watch them. They're all right there on uh, onestepdeeperpodcast.com. We do debut these on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern over on YouTube. So type in a keyword search, One Step Deeper. You will find the show there 4 p.m. Eastern on Sunday afternoons. It also is simulcast at the same time over on Instagram. And we put the link up over at Facebook as well, One Step Deeper, easy to find. Mondays, we are a traditional podcast. Go check us out, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, a-L-E-X-A, all the great places that you can listen to the podcast. And yeah, if you feel so inclined, as uh, Brittany can't see with her foggy glasses, go leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a star review on Spotify, and it really helps us out. As always, if you if you love the full show, great. But maybe you want a little taste of it a few days ahead of time. Go check out the tidbit that I put up. It's on YouTube. It's on my page, Living Low Carb Man. It's on the One Step Deeper page. It's also uh, on both Instagram and Facebook. Brittany's having a time with her glasses. What's up, girl? <laughs> well, I could. I literally couldn't see. It was like there was something on them, and I would put them on and be like a dot of something. But they're done. I'm clean. I'm so sorry. I thought she was using this as the behavioral change for Jimmy for some reason. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that here in a minute. And finally, the One Step Deeper Journal that found you guys. We're recording this right at the time where we hope it's days away. So by the time this airs, it might be available and we're screaming it from the mountaintops. And I promise you next week, if that's true, next week we will be like, go get the book, go get the book, go get the book. Yeah. So... We're excited to have that coming here very soon. But here in episode 61, Miss Brittany, behavioral change, it's more than just having knowledge. Sometimes it's your best friend looking at you right on a screen, taking her glasses off and cleaning it, and you're like, uh, 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 what, what, what are you, uh, huh? <laughs> that was funny to me. Oh, yeah, my bad. That was a little distracting, but it was distracting. I'm like, I cannot focus if my glasses are foggy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so the truth is, you know, it, it's not as simple as just knowing something. I mean, think about smokers. I mean, it, in this day and age, smokers know the dangers. Um, parents yelling at their kids, that, like studies after studies after studies have been published, but just knowing doesn't change the behavior. And so that's what we're going to get into today is like, what else is required? to change that behavior that, that you know so much about. I mean, I have to think about myself a lot. Listen, <laughs> especially this week, I had an emotional turmoil happen Saturday and I knew all the things like I, I know all the emotional things. I I've done this work for a long time and in the moment I'm having this reaction and I'm sitting here going, I know I'm having this reaction. I know what's going on. I know the inner thoughts, 
but I can't stop crying and being upset about it. And that was because I needed to feel it to the end. I needed to feel my feels about it. But yeah, I mean, so often, myself included, I can know all the things and still not follow through on the behavioral change. Well, knowledge is a great starting point. I think if people don't know, then they're not going to be able to change. So that is a great starting point. But it's the secret sauce around the knowledge that's important. How does that knowledge make you feel? Does it? that like instigate you wanting to make the change because if it doesn't it's just like it it's kind of like that spouse that they're there but they never communicate they never express any affection or love they're just there always there well that's what knowledge is it's just always there it's that it's that uh lifeless spouse that's really nothing more to you than just okay it's just always there so knowledge can be struck uh have have a a fire ablaze to it if you just add a little bit of all right what does this knowledge mean to me how can i apply it for me forget how it's applied to everyone else it's about you at that point like you on saturday you had all this knowledge and you also have more than just knowledge so this is what's interesting about your example is even when you've done work even when you know things to go one step deeper than just the knowledge of changing behavior, you still broke down and it lasted for a couple of days there. Now you bounced back very quickly. I will give you big kudos because normally you would have gone in your cocoon and you wouldn't have come out for weeks with this kind of thing to happen to you. But you were talking to me the next day. You were literally talking to everybody. You pulled a Jimmy. You start calling everybody that you know and love and said, I need, I need you. And I was like, cool. I love it. And, and, so change for you now is taking that experience and kind of saying, great me, I know, I know this stuff. I know what's going on. Why, why, going back to that question, keep asking why, why? So why, why did you uh, have that reaction? Oh, 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 that's interesting, but why? And as you dig deeper, behavioral change happens because you're like, holy crap, the surface value was one thing which made me turn off wanting to change my behavior. But now that I go 20 million steps deeper, I'm like, okay, now it makes sense. Now I can actually make the change. And I think this is a big point. Sorry for hogging the mic, but when you get to the very root cause of anything in your life, that's where the change happens. That's how you can change anything. And so from a behavioral standpoint, you go way deep and you get to that point like I I can point back to a lot of things from my childhood asking you where things started in fact just before we came on the air we were talking about one such thing uh in my life that uh and and I have been able to have a behavior change about so it's it's a big deal when you can get to that point but in the moment like you had on Saturday not so fun it's the more the deeper that you go and, and you said something you know it the knowledge almost has to spark something inside of you. And yes. it, it almost has to be like an aha moment. And so if on the surface you're having all of these reactions and you're not really feeling any want, desire to change or make any changes, um, go one step deeper. Feel it out there. Does it excite you to learn this? And then go even deeper and even deeper. And so, like, for the purpose of the show, I feel like I have to tell a little bit of the story, um, you know, there's a person in my life who is a parent and I have lots of those. And so I won't name the parent, but um, (laughs) like, seriously, guys, I have a lot of parents. Um, And this parent had said some really horrible things to me and not like overtly, not like you're a terrible person. Just what they were accusing me of led me to feel bad. And immediately I just felt bad there was no OSD I just was upset I got in the car after we were leaving my body was shaking I was why man didn't even bother to say anything other than I can tell you're upset that's literally all he said to me it took me probably 15 minutes to just get to a place where I could speak I was so upset and so reactive and then I do the one step deeper okay why did I react this way why did I feel this and I was like okay cool And then a little deeper and a little deeper. And I got to the end of it. It was because as a child, this same person had said things to me that made me feel like shit. 
and made me feel guilty and made me feel all of these things. And so by this person, even though what they said wasn't like detrimental or the worst thing ever, what they said to me brought up all of that. And so now I have the knowledge that it's not just about this situation. It's about all of those situations. And now that I have the knowledge and it sparked something inside of me to go, oh, well, that's why I reacted so big. And it calmed me down to know I reacted so big. I had the knowledge that I reacted so big, not because of that moment, but because of all of this. And just having that knowledge, because I went all the way deeper, I was like, oh, okay. It's all right. It's okay. And so, yeah, I think going one step deeper in all of this knowledge that you have, find that moment where you have that, that breath of fresh air where you can move forward and decide, okay. No, I'm not going to take whatever they said. I'm not going to take that personally. I'm just going to keep moving on. Because also in one step deeper, and now I'm hogging. Also in one step deeper, you not only have to look at yourself and the knowledge that you have to of yourself, you have to look at the other person. Why did the other person say this to me? What knowledge do they have that's affecting how they're speaking to you? And so that might spark something too. And so I know this person who was speaking to me the years and years of unprocessed trauma that they carry. And so when they make a comment, I can go, okay, in my knowledge brain, their behavior is this way because of X, Y, Z. Well, and I'm going to kind of throw a monkey wrench in this conversation, which always makes it fun. So part of our reticence to behavior change, uh, just being predicated on knowledge is when we were kids and we were in the midst of our trauma, um, we were told that what we were doing was bad yeah. when it wasn't really bad. It was a projection of what they did maybe when they were a kid, maybe the kinds of like activities that they were involved with. They're now saying, well, that's you. And so you learn not to trust yourself and the knowledge you have. And so therefore, when you have knowledge, you're like, OK, but it's not good enough. I've been told. That knowledge is not applicable to you. And so that that's a big one, Brittany. If people grew up in a situation, and you and I both did, me a little more aggressively with the verbal, uh, yours was passive aggressive, mine was just full on aggressive at me, um, saying like blunt statements, but both are very harmful. It makes you kind of go, I know, but do I know? What, what do I know? When you have been gaslit, for years of your life and told that your experiences and what you hear isn't real and what you're experiencing isn't real. Like you said, you begin to question yourself. So honestly, like you said, you can't even make the behavioral change because you doubt the knowledge that you have because someone told you to doubt yourself. And so, wow, that, yeah, you're right. You just threw a big one in there because that, I mean, it's true. And I've been there too of doubting myself for years because, and I, and I would like search out other people because of what happened to me as a child. And I was made to question anything, any decision, any mindset, anything. I would reach out to somebody older than me. It's not always a bad thing, but I'd be like, how do you feel about this? And it would be just me giving my knowledge and asking them, hey, what, how do you feel about this? like searching out what another human being would say about my situation, except it's not really on them, is it? It's it's on me and it should be on me. But because like you said, we were taught to question ourselves for so long, we can't make any changes because we just, we question the knowledge that we do have. That was cool. Yeah, and then like the behavior changes they wanted you to make, they kind of forced on you. So you kind of have also a rebellion against having change forced onto you because no, I want to be in control because you couldn't be in control. So it can kind of make you stubborn and kind of make you kind of set in your ways a bit. And you and I both experienced that right out of our trauma. I've told you some of the stories in college and being so intellectually great, socially, I was so stupid. It wasn't even funny. I didn't know how to be anything because I wasn't allowed to be. So when I was all by myself, I kind of sowed my wild oats for a year. I I didn't go to church for a year and I I didn't like go out drinking and and all that. But I I just 
I didn't care for a year because behaviorally I was told you had to do these things. And all I saw was negativity from that behavior. Oh, let's go to church. Oh, on the way to church, let's get the shit beat out of you. Okay, that's lovely. Sure, Jesus is proud of that. So the first thing I do when I go off to college, uh, fuck church. Yeah. And I let it go for a year. I did come back and and got connected and all the things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those situations where you can't just look at the behavior of someone in the moment and make any judgment call because you don't know what led them to that decision about the behavior they're exhibiting. Is it some knowledge that's predicated on a false premise that makes them make bad choices you can't say that person is a bad person if they didn't get good knowledge to begin with yeah i love that you brought up the word premise because it reminded me in homeschool right now with the girls i'm literally going through teaching them philosophy and you may think uh why because they're nine seven and four well well, the four-year-old doesn't really participate, but the other two do. But philosophy and critical thinking and being able to see one premise, a second premise, draw a conclusion, and is it real? Is it fake? Is it, this is this goes into the knowledge of what is coming in? Like, and I can't help but go with this. You know, people are so like, we want to lose weight, or we want to do this, or we want to do that. We want to make the change, right? But we have this bombarding amount of knowledge that comes in and I would dare to say it's really not knowledge it's just information but we're just bombarded with this and humans at least the humans that I'm around most of the time don't have the ability to process it and turn information into knowledge because there's so much information we're so bombarded with I mean Jimmy does one type of dieting and I'm doing something different because of recovery and it's just like which one's right? There has to be a right one. And I think that that's wrong. And I think, a two, when it comes to knowledge and behavior changes, we have to identify that there's not necessarily a right and a wrong. It's just what's right for you. And then having the critical thinking skills of, like you said, putting yourself in another person's shoes, of not making a judgment, not judging somebody else based off their decisions, and maybe like pausing for a second, like I did with this parent, and go, <sighs> Okay, I know why they did this. Doesn't make it right, but I know why they did this. And if they would just pause for just 10 seconds and give me that same critical thinking skill of, wow, that's my daughter and I don't agree with her, but I understand. But I'm not given that. And many times in society in general, we, we butt heads at that place. What's that like? You're my son. I want to put myself in your shoes to know how you feel. I know you've never gotten it either. So <laughs> I, I would I would flip out if my dad, uh, when I was being abused, ever said, tell me how you're feeling, son. Are you OK? Like the, what? That would have I would have probably passed out feigning of like, OK, the, Jesus is coming back. Something's happening because <laughs> this is like apocalyptic what's happening. Uh, but I want to shift over to, with this topic, behavioral change is more than just knowledge. The marketing people, the advertising people, they know this to the hilt. Because how easy would it be to put on the screen the picture of your product and one gram sugar, five grams fiber, 250 calories, uh, you know, and that kind of just the basics of just the knowledge of the product. No, they don't do that. Wait, you guys, you're never going to believe. Watch what happens when you have this. You eat this, it burns fat, it, it makes breakfast for you. I mean, it just, they know the fine art of adding to more than just knowledge to get you to change your behavior. And in this case, the behavior is by their product. And so why would we think it'd be any different in our lives that we couldn't and wouldn't want to sell our sell ourselves on not just what that knowledge is, but what the what the knowledge is doing. Let's talk. Let's talk about the ice bath that I'm doing for a moment. I have so many people. I'm getting in an ice bath. Those of you that don't know, 32 degree Fahrenheit, five minutes a day, every day in the year 2022. And so I get in there and I see all kinds of snarky comments. Oh, I never do that. 
And so their knowledge is cold is painful, painful is not desirable, therefore no thank you. So yes. I'm daily offering them not just an example uh, of someone doing it, but also giving them knowledge and studies and other research, and this is what it's doing for you, da 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 and, and so it's more than just knowledge. I'm also trying to persuade them and saying, hey, look, this is how I feel because of the things that I'm doing. And, and I've got this happening with my brain health and this in my mood and, oh, my body temperature is doing this. Isn't that cool? And so you do all these things to intrigue people and it's the, it's the knowledge, but then it's like much more. It's like, kind of like this marketing campaign for the knowledge that creates yeah. that behavioral change. A lot of people ask me, Jimmy, how do you get such good deep sleep? Well, there's a lot of things that I do, but one of the newest things that I recently added is this upgraded magnesium from a company called Upgraded Formulas. Go to their website, upgradedformulas.com, and you can learn all about this nano uh, technology that they use for this particular mineral of magnesium. Again, it's called Upgraded Magnesium, and it's got all the different forms of magnesium in it using the nanotechnology so it gets absorbed a lot better. Guys, I have seen my deep sleep improve by as much as 30 to 40% simply by adding in this product along with sunshine exposure, darkness in the room, cooler temperature, all of the things that I always have done. So again, upgradedformulas.com is the website. Go check them out. Yes. Yeah, I, I do the same thing, you know, in my stories when I'm talking to people about um, emotional things and feelings and, and all of that. I, I give them the other side of it to make it seem appealing. But I always kind of do the guys, this shit is hard. OK, it's this is hard. But I always give the other side of it. Hey, but after you have these realizations, this is what happens. And so I guess I kind of do the same thing. We all really kind of do the same thing. But, yeah, you're you're right. The other side of this is that marketing, that tricky marketing that's out there that tells you that, oh, you must change in order to be X, Y, Z, which I don't agree with. And some people think it's manipulative when you have that kind of thing. And look, I'm not talking about used car salesmen. They are the most manipulative uh, agents of, of change trying to sell you a crap. I, I had that happen to me once and I was eyes wide open about yeah. what was happening didn't like what he was doing and did it. I remember he was trying to open the door. Oh, I need some WD-40. I'll be right back. And it's just like, if you can see that it's skeevy, run. Run. And not the behavior change you need. But if you see someone's genuine, you see someone's trying to at least appeal to another side of you besides just your head knowledge. You yeah. know, although I do think it has swung a little bit in our culture too much in the other direction where people don't even turn to knowledge they only turn to feelings and how some message is being you know and it's got like tender music in the background when i was growing up it was the feed feed the children in africa in the arms of an angel yes. like yes. they play that song and every time i hear that song on the radio now i just like mm. it's just like because you think of that that marketing and and it, and it's powerful yeah it's a little manipulative well, I, and I wrote this down, stress and other uncomfortable emotions, because side note, remember, I don't believe in good emotions, bad emotions. You have comfortable ones like happiness, joy, peace, and then you have uncomfortable ones like sadness and guilt and grief. OK, just want to throw that in there. Stress and other uncomfortable emotions supersede knowledge. And people know that that's where the manipulative things come in, because yeah. You can know something, but when someone puts the plinky plunky music in the background, it becomes manipulative and, and like appealing to your emotions. And it gets you to change behavior without even acknowledging your knowledge at all because of all of those manipulations that, that go along with that. And I'm not going to use this as an opportunity to speak my personal things, but there are some really big organizations especially in the South that use this tactic that they bring you in yeah. and they manipulate you with that music and get your feels going and get to everything inside of you just crying out. They manipulate your behavior before you even have a chance to acknowledge what you know. Oh, I'll go there because I've been a part of, uh, I went to a Joyce Meyer conference one time. Love 
Joyce Meyer as a teacher, she is a spitball fire. You've never seen her before. She's amazing in her teaching. You watch her on television. So my ex-wife and I went to one of her conferences when she came to Virginia Beach. And I was like, all right, let's go. I like her on TV. And it was like eight o'clock in the morning. I'm like, wow, they record early. That's that's really early. I get there at eight o'clock. It's not starting at nine or 10 or 11 or 12. She didn't come on the stage till three o'clock in the afternoon. So what did we do in the meantime? We're sitting there and they're speaking in tongues, which I was expecting. Um, they were, yeah, I was yawning. Exactly. That's what I was, I was so like, what's happening here? And then they'd have all kind of praise and worship and they'd work, you know, work you up into a frenzy. People were running up and down the aisles and bouncing up and down. And I'm just going, this feels cultish. And I hated to say that out loud in my head. I even talked to the ex-wife. I was like, are you comfortable? She's like, no. I'm like, good. Neither am I. So. <laughs> And I had to tell the Lord tonight that I have gone as far as I can go. <laughs> I have been telling him for two years, take me deeper if you want to. I'm willing to do whatever you need me to do, but I really don't want to go on like this. I feel I've gone as far as I can go. I want the pressure to let up, and I would also like a few feelings. <laughs> Come on, anybody with me out there? idea was you would be more receptive to the behavioral changes that Joyce was going to say when she's on stage. Mission accomplished because it was, you're right, it's hypnotic, it's manipulative, it's meant to wear you down, stress you out, back to your original point, so that whatever Joyce said, you just went, uh-huh, uh-huh. And again, I don't want to sour anybody's view of her or anybody else like her, but you just have to know how the sausage is made in that instance. They work those people up to an, into a frenzy so that when you watch them on television, they're just like, they're in a daze, literally, to be forced a behavioral change. And anything she said, whether you had knowledge about it at all or, or at all or not, um, you're going to believe it. And, and look at like even what's happened the last couple of years in our lives all this fear and stress and now people say things and then people just lap it up as if it's just 100 percent true and it's not always yeah like all of the all of, mm, I, and i hate to even sound conspiratorial here but like all of the bombardment has just kept us at a stress level so high that we we can't process any information that's coming in, uh, it, we can't. It's, we're so overwhelmed by all of it. I mean, myself included here, guys, like I've sat in my room trying to make a decision about certain things. And I'm just like, how do I even begin? Where do I even begin? Because this person says this thing and this person says this one. And the, how do you even have knowledge to even make a change? Because there's so much. There's so, and. Uh, yeah. So just remember that stress when you're in these kind of situations and you're looking for this, that stress and un uncomfortable emotions will supersede any knowledge that that you do have. And then in those times, you have to be careful. I know for myself right now, I'm working through recovery in a particular area. And when stress levels go higher and higher and higher and I can't feel the knowledge and I can't I can't seek it out, I just seek comfort. And comfort isn't always a good thing. That's when we talk about these numbing agents that numb out all of this stress levels that we're having. I can't even change the behavior that I want to change that I know needs to change because I'm so highly stressed that the thing that I want to change and causing me harm, the stress is leading me back to it because this is my safety area. This is what I've known. This is my my numbing agent for the stress. The stress yes. from the thing is causing stress, but I can't fix the thing because of the stress is overwhelming the knowledge that I need to fix the thing. And the sad part is I followed every bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, Saturday was a prime example for you. Yeah. Like you got thrust into this situation. You didn't know when you were going to encounter this, this parent that this was going to happen. It just came out of nowhere. And almost when the incident happened that upset you, you were almost like, wait, what's happening? 
Like it, it probably felt surreal to you because things had been relatively good with this person. And so it, it's so weird that, that you have to be on guard at any moment that people are going to have to, people are going to try to make you have a behavioral change that maybe you don't want to do. And this is where having more than just knowledge comes in handy. This is why you guys watch a show called One Step Deeper or listen to it, One Step Deeper podcast, or you read our upcoming book. Like the reason you're doing this work is you want to be on guard. It's almost like there's snipers everywhere, Brittany, and we're trying to see who they are and who in our lives are trying to manipulate us into behavior changes that we don't want to do. And especially those of us who have had it done to us as kids, hardwired in our brains is that that whatever someone else says, we do. Yeah. And although you and I have overcome that a lot, a lot of people that haven't done the one step deeper work, the personal development and growth journey work, they just kind of go along and, and we see it in society all the time. And that's why manipulators are able to like take advantage of people um, and I, you know, do all these dastardly things all under the guise of, well, it's for your best interest. I'm just trying to help you change and be better for you. Bullshit. It's about whatever they want you to be. Yeah. And, and on that note, I just wanted to point out that when you finally step into your own knowledge and you make changes that you want to make, not because anybody else convinced you to, or somebody, no, when it's all for you and someone else, I mean, honestly, I would dare say they get triggered. They get triggered by you being in yourself and they yes. treat you a certain way and think that you're a bitch. Like literally, that was the vibe that I was getting that because I was stepping into my own and not following their path, not following what they wanted for me. I was horrible. I was a bitch. I yeah. was terrible. I was disrespectful when I was just trying to make the point that what you see as needed behavior change in your life is not what I see in my life. Like I just, one of the basics, there was a lot of things that were brought up, but one of them is uh, using cuss words. You guys have listened to OSD enough to know Brittany does not give a shit. I do not care. Okay. It doesn't affect me. It's not harmful. I'm not cussing people out saying you're a horrible la la la, whatever, but it's just a little bit of spice into my language. It doesn't bother me. I speak it around my kids and that was just like this whole ordeal. And then I just literally had to look at the person and say, listen, that's a you problem. That's not a Britney problem. So if it affects you, I apologize. But this is not a problem. And I'm not, I'll be respectful when I'm around you. But just understand, I'm just being respectful to you. That doesn't mean that I'm changing who I am. I'm going to yeah. respect that you don't want to hear that. But just so you know, when I'm by myself and I'm with my people and I'm with Jimmy and I'm with my husband and my kids, Brittany is exactly who she is, and language doesn't bother me. So, just an example. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, you bring up a really good point. This whole idea of behavioral change, there are going to be people, and there are people in your life right now. Guys, think about the people in your life. There are people right there, right now. You talk to them. You've seen them in person. They are trying to change your behavior whether you even realize they are or not. And, and they're doing it through all these other ways besides knowledge. They might add in a little knowledge just to kind of solidify it, but they're trying to shape you into the mold of who they want you to be, which is why doing this work on yourself and realizing that behavioral change is so much more than knowledge, if you have the cognizance of it, and Brittany, you don't give yourself enough credit with this thing that happened on Saturday, Yes, it was horrible in the moment. Yes, you got upset. You had all the normal feel the feels reaction. But the fact that you bounced back so quickly is a clear sign that you were able to process this, know what it was, realize what was happening, and then shift away from that and say, that's a you problem, not a me problem. That's big. Like, that's that's really, really big. I want you to celebrate that because circa three years ago when we first started being friends, that would not have happened. No, no, it would have been a long process. And I wanted to bring up that even unknowingly, we do try to change other people's behavior um, in things that we say or, or our body language or what have you. And a big area that this happens is in parenting. Um, I'm not a perfect parent. I don't put it out there that I'm a perfect parent. I do practice 
gentle parenting, respectful parenting, peaceful, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Um, I just call it parenting. But uh, one of the things that I see very often and that I even participated in is um, behavioral changes trying to come from violence or loud yelling and stuff. Just remember that when it comes to, especially in parenting, the best way to get behavioral change is modeling. And this can apply to parents and everybody else. I'm just going to use it as a parenting example. So I hear a lot of times read on Facebook. um, Oh, I just don't understand why my son, my daughter is so loud and disruptive. I just I just don't understand why they won't listen to me. They never listen to me. I've told them I've yelled at them, go to bed. And I've even spanked them and tried to put him in the bed. Why won't he listen to me? And the tough love side of me curbed in a little bit of gentleness is um, because he's watching or he or she is watching how you react to discomfort. And so you're uncomfortable because they're not in the bed. Well, they're uncomfortable because they don't want to be in the bed because they're a child and they don't want to miss anything. And so instead of saying, hey, man, dude, that's tough. I'm so sorry, but you got to go to bed. You got to sleep. You need sleep. I need sleep. We got to get, in the, you know, instead of being understanding and meeting them there, that why are you out of bed? That's, and so you're trying to change the behavior by being violent or even, you know, spanking or yelling or raising your voice. And so then they learn when they're uncomfortable, what do they do? They raise their voice and they disrupt and they may even hit. They may become violent themselves because unknowingly you're modeling to them how to react in a situation. And so their knowledge, go ahead. Well, and even the threat of whatever the yelling, spanking, whatever they were going to do to you, the threat makes you self change your behavior. I I did that a lot when I was a kid. I'm just, you're flooding back all these memories that I had that knowing that the consequences for me of, of not doing something that I knew my dad wanted me to do, the consequences of it in my head made me take pause and change my behavior of what I wanted to do. Now, that's not to say, especially a child, that everything a child wants to do is the right thing to do. But I found myself like having that just automatic reaction of being more timid, being more enclosed um, and, and not speaking up because I knew all of those things would make him do those nasty things to me more often. So after a while, and so then when I got out of the house, guess what happened? That behavioral change that was instituted by this fear of what would happen, Mm -hmm. and I had to self-induce it, it continued. Like everybody's like, oh, you got out of the house. Everything was okay. I'm like, everything was not okay. I might have been free from the direct abuser, but the abuse continued right here right in your head and it still did for many years all those coping mechanisms all the behavioral changes that were instituted by the threat yeah i I, you know i look back on my life and i i've talked very openly in in interviews about 20s were a blur i don't even like remember much of my 20s because all of it was just why is my life in shambles why am i a wreck why can't i get forward in life why am I always so upset? Why am I angry? Why, why do I feel uneasy, even though internally I know I have so much for my life left to be done? I didn't know where that was going to happen because it was just a constant whirlwind all throughout my 20s. And, and it, was that, it was that very thing of the behavioral changes my dad wanted me to do. He didn't even have to say them after a while. Yeah. I did myself because yeah. the knowledge at that point uh, kicked in of what would happen. And I couldn't feel anything beyond that. That was it. It was survival. And this, and again, out of his house, the survival lasted into my early 30s. Did you go keto and thought you had to give up wine? Well, let me introduce you to Dry Farm Wines. It is the world's first sugar-free alcohol that is lower than your typical wines. Organic made it local farms that do it the right way. Most of the wines that you buy are from three really big companies loaded with additives and preservatives. So many dozens of those kinds of things. You don't want all that junk in your wine. So go to dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy. 
and they will ship you these wines. And just because you listen to this podcast, Dry Farm Wines is going to give you a bottle in your first order for just one cent. Go to dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy and uh, you will get your bottle of wine for just one singular penny. Go check them out. Dry Farm Wines, you guys. It's wine o'clock somewhere. Let's go get some wine. And and you were talking about, you know, just like having all these feelings that you didn't really know where they came from or you didn't really know why. Or you didn't. Be, that's because that's what was modeled to you. And so when you would get upset, all of these internal feelings that didn't align with who Jimmy is. I know who Jimmy is. But like maybe in your 20s, you, you and I'm assuming that you didn't know who you were. And all you were at the point in your 20s was this unhealed broken man who was trying not to be like his dad but couldn't help because all that had been modeled to him was yelling and anger and and yeah. bitterness and pain that's all that had been modeled and so you're just a a human being walking around of i don't want to be that but i don't know how to be this you you had the knowledge that this wasn't it for you but you couldn't find the behavior changes because all that had ever been modeled to you was don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. There was no modeling. And so that's what I try to do in my parenting. So one of the things is I don't want secrets with my kids, but in order to not have secrets with my kids, I can't just tell them I don't want to have secrets. I have to tell them things that other people might not tell them. I have to have very, <laughs> my friend and I were having a conversation laughing about this. Kami has asked, if you're old enough to ask the question, you're old enough to know the answer. That's always been my philosophy. Cammie's nine. She's starting to ask some big questions that as a parent make you kind of tremble a little bit, but I stay calm and I just communicate with her. And I mean, we just talked about communication. I just give her that open line. And so down the road, she won't ever feel like she has to have a secret because I didn't keep secrets from her. And so I'm just modeling what I want out of the relationship. And even like with our friendship, for example, I model to you that I have boundaries. I don't have to yell at you or scream at you. I just have to say, hey, that's my line. And in return, I expect the same exact thing from Jimmy because I've modeled what I, how I operate myself. You've modeled how you operate yourself. And now we have a relationship. And so the behavior change, which I don't even want to say it's really a behavior change. It's just a modification of, oh, OK, cool. This is what we're going to do. And one thing that uh, has happened in our friendship is, friendship is we have seen behavioral change on both sides because of the other person, but it yeah. wasn't out of force. I didn't purposely try to force anything that I believed on you and vice versa. And we still have great differences as we talked about many times, but I have changed things about me because at this point, the more the knowledge is relationship, connection, true, genuine care and concern. I get all that from you. Yeah. That comes everything about knowledge. You could tell me all your knowledge in the world, kind of like that whole saying, uh, they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. I know this little lady cares. And so when she says things to me, and sometimes they're hard, you're not scared to tell me because you know I'll take it well. And then sometimes I go, mm, yeah. And I've made changes. I'm, I'm a different man, and I have changed my behavior because of the connection we've had. And so guys, this is another key point and vice versa. This is another key point. Find those people in your life, like your Brittany or your Jimmy in your life that can give you that, not just knowledge, but show you by example, hey, I am willing to hear from you. And and if you see something, da, da, da. not that I'm sitting there going, yeah, let's no. see part of you, I would, ne I know better. I would get excoriated so bad yeah. uh, in loving terms, but um, yeah, loving terms. Uh, but no, um, you you can make changes that way. And I think that's a healthy way, Brittany. Like, this is why I value you as my friend, not just because of our conversations and the connection, but that kind of thing. Yeah. Like I say today, and I say it often, I'm a better human being today because of Brittany Lee Davis. And there's parts of what you have struck in my mind uh, and taken that knowledge and said, oh, but what about this, this, and this? Oh, 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 wow. Oh, yeah. oh. 
and it's 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 eye opening in a good way. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you felt similar. I wrote something down because you said something and it sparked and I was like, oh my gosh, one of those Brittany one liners has come up. I will probably repeat this one forever and ever like feel the feels. Oh my goodness. Behavioral change has to come from connection, not coercion. And and so I like think about everything that we've now brought up, everything, the media and relationships with people. If the behavior change inside of you is coming from a place of coercion, no. And I'm not just talking about connection with another person, connection with self. Like, yes. are you connecting with yourself and making changes that you want to make? You know, I mean, I don't want to get into the depths of it, but I am recovering in a certain area. And in that recovery, I've had to ask myself, why did I want to change X, Y, Z? Was it because society told me to? Was it because I didn't think that I could be loved being this or that? What what was it? And in the end of it, it was coercion by outside forces that led me to want to change something. And if I had just connected with self and context and, and maybe even what what we've done an episode called You Can't Change What You Hate, it's kind of the same lines here. You can't hate yourself into change and someone else can't coerce you into change. It might be temporary, but it's not going to be lasting. And it's also going to make you feel miserable. If you change something based on coercion, you're going to you're going to feel miserable. And, you know, I changed myself as a teenager, as a child so that I wouldn't get beaten and I wouldn't get hit and I wouldn't get abused. I changed things about myself to become less than so I wouldn't be seen. I gained weight so that my sexual abuser wouldn't find me attractive. I changed these things about myself out of coercion, out of fear. And now that I'm older, I'm getting to a place where, hey, I just I, I want to connect with me before I make a change. Wild man and I, we we always when there's a problem and we butt heads and because we're in a relationship, we're going to do that. It could be something basic like, hey, could you take out the freaking trash? We argued so many years ago about taking out the trash. It's so hilarious. And we just instead of trying to coerce him and guilt him into taking out the trash, I paused for a second and connected with him and just said, hey, I feel like I do the dishes and you do the trash, you know, and like or, you know. And then here's another one. And I wasn't even trying to be manipulative. I was really just trying to connect with him. Yeah. When you walk outside and you go to work and you walk right past the trash can and you don't take the time to take the trash out. That doesn't just feel as simple as I didn't take the trash out. It feels like you ignored me and ignored that. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I never knew that. It's Connect true. Connection. Yes. And now we never have a problem. Although the way you created behavioral change with that one, you told the story in a long time ago episode. One day you're like, all right, asshole's not taking out the trash. I'm gonna take it. So you grabbed the trash, and took it out, and then he goes, well, where's the trash? Oh, it got taken out. And what happened next? He, he made sure he took it out. He always took it out from then on. <laughs> you know what? Ain't no woman of mine going to do my trash. Oh, okay. Good, good, darling. Uh, and, and on the Big Bang Theory, uh, Sheldon's mom was really good at that kind of thing. Now don't you move. I'll bring over all the food. No, no, no. I can do it. <laughs> well, isn't that sweet? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm so parched. Oh, well, let me give you. Yeah, thank you, dear. And so she's like kind of behavioral change with, with manipulation. We're not saying manipulate anybody. Please don't. But. It's uh, it's powerful when it's that bond there. So yeah. there's probably things that you not probably there are things that you have uh, had change in your life behaviorally because of wild man. Mm -hmm. And let's go here that you've had things change in your life because of your kids. You've talked very openly how sometimes your littles they will just drop a bomb on you, baby, and you're just like, uh, oh, oh, wow, wow, and so. Don't think you're ever too young or too old to learn from somebody that is close to you that will give you a behavioral change that's so much more than knowledge. Your little your little Alma could say something to you that you know inherently in your head, but when she says it and it's shot to the heart, you're too late. Like yeah. that's that's so much more meaningful and it's gonna stick. 
yeah, it's not coming to mind what it was, but I just, I remember within the last year, Cami, I had a, an instance with Cami where she just kind of like gut punched me with something that I was, oh, I got it. Um, I require them to do a simple few chores in the morning before they get their electronics and um, like before they get their tablets. It's very simple, like load or unload the dishwasher, whichever it is. Make sure your bed's made up, brush your teeth, eat breakfast. That's literally their morning chore list or feed the dog, water the dog. Simple stuff. Um, it should take them 10 minutes or less to do their chores. And Cammy had got me one good, got, got me good, good one day because I had come downstairs before they woke up and I was just sitting on the couch flipping on the TV. And she's like, why don't you have to make your bed before you watch TV? <laughs> oh, snap. Oh, snap. <laughs> Damn. So now what does Brittany do now? <laughs> there for a second and I wanted to be reactive and upset because I'm the freaking adult that's why but I was like yeah. oh you have a point young one yes ma'am and she makes it every day now you guys I do I do and it's not that I wasn't a person that like I like making my bed but that particular time that my child said that I now make it a point my bed is made upstairs before I came downstairs <laughs> Yes, either yeah. make a bed or put a lock on or put a put a lock on mommy's door so Cammy can't see it's not made. So <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's just one of those things that I, we have that connection. Yeah. So she wasn't she just asked me a question and we have that open line of communication that I let her ask me those questions and I like damn it, you got a point, kid. Thanks. Uh yeah. I, I have to change. And then I, and I did because it is true out of that relationship. And I have respect for if I require something of her, I need to require it of myself. And, and that's that's big. Like you can't have someone say you need to X, whatever the X is, behavioral change. And then they themselves not do it. I, I get it a lot online. Well, you need to just X and you'll lose weight. And I'm like, OK. Um, have you done this or are you just talking out of your ass like it's it's just it's it's a good lesson throughout all of your life to just know who you're talking to and about have that connection with them and make the change and that includes yourself i love that we keep hearkening back this this connection isn't just with other people it's with yourself and yes you have knowledge but also you have uh, a personality you have an enneagram type I was thinking about that even before we came on the air. I wonder what role Enneagram plays in this whole behavioral change. It plays a big role, kind of knowing where you stand. What's the other one? Myers Briggs, right? The other one? Yeah, Briggs. yeah, Myers. Yeah, but so. Everybody's always yeah. asking what the little letters are, and I'm like, I don't know. I just know my Enneagram. So. Yeah, yeah, I only really focus on Enneagram. Yeah, so, uh, so the behavioral change, it's all within you and those people who genuinely care about you. If someone other than that, yourself, or someone that cares about you is trying to get you to make a behavioral change, all the knowledge in the world ain't gonna work. And if you feel yourself compelled to change because of one of those people, and you know they don't have your best interest in mind, why are you trying to change to whatever they want you to be? And, and I hate to say it, it can be family that might not have your best interest in mind. Brittany's got this parent in her life. Jimmy's got his dad. I'm sorry, you lost that privilege of being able to have the connection with me because you never wanted to connect with me. So therefore the behavioral change that you think I am that makes me whatever kind of parent in your case or whatever kind of human being in my case, um, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you're blood or not. Brittany, uh, Brittany gets a lot of, of hate for kind of drawing the line of blood or not. It, it doesn't matter to me. You know, there are people that have been put in my life in terms of family that I can't control, that we are blood related. But if you don't have my best interest at heart, I don't care who you are. You, you can't be in my life. You yeah. can't be in my kid's life. I'm not going to allow you to hurt me or hurt my kids or hurt my husband. I don't care who you are. And 
I know that's hard for some people because, you know, for so, especially in different cultures, I don't want to get too much because I know we're running out of time, but like, especially in different cultures, family, it's everything, everything. you know, and, and, and I, I have to tiptoe because in the culture that I was raised, family is a lot, but it's not everything. And so, you know, that's a new area that I'm learning when it comes to this, but yeah, I just have a strong feeling that if you aren't feeding into me, and I'm not feeding it to you. Like me too, me too. If if I hurt you, please cut me. I I, I will I will try not to take it personally. Um, but I I really feel like if someone's trying to coerce you into changing and being something just because that's what they are and they can only love you and accept you if you're the way they are, then they really shouldn't be in your life. Yes, <laughs> guys, this is a little bit of heavy episode here in episode sixty one. Behavioral change is so much more than just knowledge. And hopefully by now, I, I guess kind of the takeaway is find those people in your life, including you, yeah. that do care about you, respect you, and have your best interests in mind, and let them be the catalyst for changes that you need to make. They won't always have think. look, Brittany's tried to get me to change in certain ways. And it's not that I think she's wrong. What she believes is great for her. I just didn't see that it applied to me. But then in other ways, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense to me. And I'm now a better, more well-rounded person. And here's the other thing. It makes the connection even stronger when you see the other person taking what you said and applying it and then vice versa. And you're just like, whoa, that's my people. And it's yeah. it's a cool feeling when you get there. Yeah. All right, Brittany, take us home. All right, one step deeper podcast.com is the website. All the episodes are over there and you can watch them right there. Sundays, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over on YouTube. That's where all of the episodes debut. It's the first place you can find them. Instagram and face up face up. Wow, Facebook. You can... <laughs> oh gosh, why did I immediately see Nicholas Cage and John Travolta in face off? <laughs> <laughs> okay instagram and facebook guys you can find all the episodes there as well over on instagram live in low carb man becoming dot Brittany lee i put up the tidbit every week just a little 15 minute taste of the episode for you on mondays we are a traditional podcast you can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts apple spotify stitcher a-L-E-X-A. and lastly if you are listening to us over on apple leave us a review we love hearing from you guys <sighs> That's it. <laughs> that messed me up. The face off thing. Face up. <laughs> We're going to do the show like this now. Face up. Face oh, up. I, don't forget, you need to go get our new book too when it comes out in a few weeks. The One Step Deeper. This hurts. The One Step <laughs> Deeper Journal, The Foundations coming very very soon it will be on amazon so you can keep checking amazon uh in between the weeks of these airing if but if you follow us i promise you when it's out jimmy and Brittany will not shut up about it so uh you're gonna want to get a copy of that book we are so proud of that book we think you're gonna be uh happy with it too but miss Brittany, thank you for a great episode and we'll see you guys again next week see you guys one step deeper podcast.com Have you experienced the dreaded keto flu? Did you know that most of these symptoms are actually due to your body dumping excess electrolytes? This is where Element comes in. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt with no sugar. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to folks following a keto, low carb, or paleo diet. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. With none of the junk, no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. Everyone needs electrolytes, especially those on low-carb diets, or if you practice intermittent or extended fasting, if you're physically active, or sweat a lot. Add Element today and see how much better you feel and perform. Use the URL drinklmnt.com 
slash Jimmy.